Hello and thank you for watching this latest edition of 10 Minutes with Tanfield, in which Andrew Butler, Casey and I will be discussing the emergence of the so-called Marex tort, or to give it its full snappy title, inducing or procuring a number to act in wrongful violation of rights under a judgment. I think we'll stick with the Marex tort for the rest of the webinar. Andrew, what's it all about? Thank you, Will. Well, the thinking is that if procuring someone to act in breach of contract is a tort, which it is, it would be odd if you could lawfully procure someone to act in breach of judgment obligations. It would mean that the victim of a breach of contract had less protection after his or her rights had been recognised in a judgment than they had before that had happened. And um, is this a fairly recent development in the law? Uh, yes, it stems from the first instance decision in a case called Marex and Sevalager, hence its name. Isn't Marex a leading case on the principle of reflective loss? It is, yes. It was on the reflective loss point that Marex reached the Supreme Court, a seven-person court held by a majority of four to three, that the principle of reflective loss existed, but contrary to previous thinking, which had seen it popping up everywhere, was limited to the field of company law. But this other aspect of Marex's importance is not so well known. What were the underlying facts in Marex? They were pretty simple, really. Marex obtained a judgment in a contract claim against two BVI registered companies, which were under the control of Mr. Sevalaja. It was alleged that Mr. Sevalaja transferred assets out of the companies into his personal control, so as to prevent them from being able to satisfy the judgment. Marex brought a claim against Mr. Sevalaja, relying on this new tort, and got permission to serve him outside the jurisdiction. Mr. Sevalaja replied to set that permission aside, arguing that the tort did not exist, and also that Marex's claim was barred by the reflective loss principle, because if anyone had a complaint about the unlawful stripping of the company's assets, it was the companies themselves and not Marex. So this was just a dispute about whether the order for service out should stand? Yes, and that in turn depended on who had, quotes, the better of the argument for the existence of the tort. And the judge decided that Marex did? Yes, it's quite a short judgment on this point, just 11 paragraphs. It's reported at 2017, four weeklies, 105, if anyone wants to read it. No disrespect to Mr Justice Knowles, whose judgment it is, but it doesn't do much more and didn't need to do much more than rehearse the arguments for and against the existence of the tort and decide which was stronger. Did the case go any higher on the point? Uh, yes and no. Mr Sevalager applied for permission to appeal. But interestingly, on the issue of whether the Marex tort existed, was refused it. Of course, he did get permission on the reflective loss issue, leading to the appellate decisions for which the case is better known. So Lady Justice Asplin, who refused permission to appeal, obviously agreed with Mr Judge Justice Knowles' conclusion that the Marex tort exists. We actually only know that because the refusal of permission is recorded in the Court of Appeal's judgment on reflective loss. And that's reported at 2018, three weeklies, 1412. So has there been any further judicial consideration of the tort? Yes, there has. In a case called Lacatania and Sue in 2021, Mr Justice Bryan took the opportunity to consider the elements of the tort a bit more fully. The judgment runs to 218 pages and 996 paragraphs, so it is a bit of a blockbuster, but the section on the Marex tort is quite short, thankfully. And is that another case of company directors putting company assets beyond the reach of creditors? No, it was mother and son on this occasion. The allegation was that a mother, son and various corporate defendants had conspired to put the son's assets beyond the reach of a judgment creditor. So what further can we take about from, from that about what's required to establish the tort? Well, Mr Justice Bryan held at paragraph 126, where he identified at 126 five what he called essential elements. These were one, a judgment, two, breach of the rights existing under that judgment, three, the defendant's procurement of that breach, four, the defendant's knowledge of the judgment, and five, the defendant's realisation that the conduct would breach those rights. And did the judge say anything more about the rationale for the existence of the tort? Uh, yes, as Mr Justice Knowles had done before him, Mr Justice Bryan said it found, and I quote, a close and I consider compelling analogy with the tort of inducing a breach of contract. He went on to say there would seem to be no compelling reason why in circumstances where the law protects against intentional interference by third parties with contractual rights. It should not equally protect against intentional interference with rights established by judgments. So, as I understand it, the decisions in both Marex and Lacatania draw on the fact that the underlying claims were in breach of contract. And if procurement of that breach is unlawful, let's call that the contractual tort, procurement or procurement of non-performance of the judgment to which the breach also led, 
also has to be considered unlawful. Yes, that's the basic rationale. So a couple of questions maybe flow from that. First, how far do the parallels with the contractual tort go? Do the same rules on, for example, knowledge, knowledge and intention apply? Yes, the parallels are close. In Lacatania, after outlining those five essential elements, Mr Justice Bryan identified a number of further principles. For example, just as so-called blind eye knowledge of the contract is sufficient in the contractual tort, so it's not necessary for the wrongdoer in the Marex tort to know the actual terms of the judgment, nor is it necessary to establish spite, desire to injure or ill will against the claimant, just the intention to procure an outcome which is in fact a violation. So are there any differences at all between the contractual tort and the Marex tort? In one respect, the Marek's tort is actually wider than the contractual tort, because in the context of the contractual tort, there can be a defence of justification. Mr Justice Bryan, while acknowledging that the issue was academic in the case before him, expressed the view that there could never be justification for procuring violation of rights under a judgment. OK, and um, the second question is this. What's the position if the underlying case is not a breach of contract claim? I think that's a really interesting question, but I think the answer must be that it doesn't matter. It can't be unlawful to procure violation of a judgment right if the judgment is for breach of contract, but lawful if the judgment is for something else, say for a tortious wrong. That seems logical. Is there any support for that in the case law? Well, I'm aware of one case from earlier this year where His Honour Judge Paul Matthews, sitting as a High Court judge, found that the Marex tort had been committed in relation to a judgment arising from a proprietary estoppel claim. That case is called G and G, uh, Neutral Citation 2022 EWHC 1369. So that decision certainly offers support for the point, although there wasn't in fact much argument about it. I suppose that leads to another question. What if there isn't in fact a judgment in place? I think the understanding of most lawyers is that it's perfectly lawful for a defendant to make themselves judgment proof before judgment. So can it be unlawful for a person to procure another to do that? Well, that's another interesting point. Certainly in Marex, that was one of the arguments deployed against the existence of the tort. Counsel in Marex referred to a 1995 case called Law Debenture Trust Corporation, where Sir Thomas Bingham referred to the legality of defendants making themselves judgment proof. Of course, there is some protection for a creditor in that situation in the form of, for example, Section 423 of the Insolvency Act 1986, but that doesn't have the effect of making the asset stripper personally liable as the Marex tort does. Uh, assuming the Marex tort is not committed in that situation, doesn't that mean that the same conduct done with the same intention could be lawful one day before the judgment is given and unlawful the next day after it's given? If so, isn't that a bit illogical, particularly if the asset stripper knows the judgment is coming. Yes, I think that is a bit illogical and is perhaps one of those things that will have to be worked through on a case by case basis. At one end of the spectrum, you'll perhaps have someone who sincerely believes in another person's innocence, helping that person divest their assets as a precautionary measure long before judgment is even on the horizon. At the other end of the spectrum, you might have someone who does the same thing, knowing that the person is a wrongdoer and that judgment is imminent and inevitable. It might become necessary for the courts to decide if a person does commit the Marex tort in the latter situation, and if so, at what point the motive and timing of their actions engages liability. So, still a few issues to work through, but it's fair to say that this newly recognised tort could, be could become a pretty important weapon in the litigator's arsenal. Undoubtedly. I think it opens up all sorts of possibilities, particularly in the context of insolvent companies. It may give rise to personal remedies against directors in circumstances where it would be difficult or impossible to pierce the corporate veil. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks also to everyone for listening to this webinar. We look forward to bringing you more commentary on topical legal issues in the very near future.